we're going to take a look here. Uh, we picked this up at the beginning, or not at the beginning, we picked this up just a little bit through in Luke chapter 11. And it has Jesus talking and focusing a lot about prayer. A lot about prayer. So we're going to hear a few of these words, uh, red letter edition style, with Jesus actually responding to these moments. We're going to pick this up on verse 5. Luke chapter 11, verse 5, and we'll be going all the way through 13. Then, and please mark this as then, I promise we'll go back to it, okay? It's for the mental bookmark on the word then. Verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and you say, Friend, would you lend me three loaves of bread? Verse 6. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I were in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship alone, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Verse 9 continues. And so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. One who seeks finds. And one who knocks, the door shall be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, would instead give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, would then give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? We ask for the Lord to bless this reading today. Prayer is such a vital and important thing in our lives. And, uh, you know, I haven't quite figured out the logistics yet, so I'm going to borrow this stand over here. Is that okay? I promise I'll put it back, okay? There's a big sign on the choir director one, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, there we go. So taking a look at, at, at these moments here in Scripture, it's important because, oh my goodness, this is... I'm going to have to bring a stand in that I know what I'm doing with, right? You all say, praise the Lord for, for new seasons, right? This is, part of new seasons. this is the stretching out moment of our season. Um, so in this section of Scripture, where we're taking a look at this, we find uh, in the Scripture context, the Bible times, right, the culture there, that this is pretty important to understand that while our community, as my wife said during the, the prayer and blessing time, enjoys, that we have been overwhelmed in a good way, you understand there's being overwhelmed in a stressful way, but overwhelmed in a good way. Um, the welcome and hospitality that we receive, not only from here at Wesley, but also outside in our surrounding community. It's really been overwhelming in a good way. It's kind of set the bar, so I think the first person that does it, you don't know, open up really well to us, we go, whoa, what's going on with you? You must be having a bad day. Because you know it's an opportunity to pray that way, right? But especially in this culture, in this time, hospitality was huge. Right? Hospitality was like a requirement mandate that all culturally would understand as a community, right? It wasn't just something we did because Jesus called us to, right? This was already existing before Jesus' living ministry. So in the world, hospitality was like this high priority that even if you were a schmuck in life, you better provide for those people that you're responsible for, right? So in this moment, we see that these bounds of, of friendship and obligation are starting to come into play. And Jesus says, the first thing he says in verse 5 is suppose. Now, how many of you know when we're telling a story and we say imagine or suppose, that it might be, you know, a, a little, we're going to ask you to use your imagination and maybe put yourself in this hypothetical situation. And that's important because today is a parable. And sometimes that's a term that can cross some of us. Well, what is that? So for those of us that aren't familiar with the term parable, it's kind of a simple little story or illustration to prove a point. Okay? And Jesus uses parables so effectively in this moment because when he asks us to imagine a hypothetical question, whether we can actually understand exactly what he's saying, Jesus is inviting us all 
to step into that situation and imagine if, right? Suppose this is happening for us. So it says, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. Now, perhaps if this is not our first time hearing this, or maybe upon hearing it, some bells are going off, right? I already talked about a little lack of sleep over the last night for myself, and so it's this moment. Can we empathize a little bit for those of us that like sleep, for those of you that like sleep? Um, that if somebody comes knocking at midnight, better be good, right? I mean, it better be one of those, are you, are you bleeding? You know, I mean, what's, what's going on? It's one of those type of emergencies. But see, this is a little bit different because He's asking a hypothetical moment. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, can you lend me three loaves of bread? Now, an invite is to kind of simmer, right? For those of us that, that have cooked before, you simmer, right? You can't do it too fast, right? The flavor, and, and you don't want to burn anything. You want to make sure everything is, is cooked right. So you simmer. You put it on a low temperature and it has to take its time to kind of sink in. So I'd ask us to simmer on that moment of friendship. Even though this is, this is a hypothetical, this is a supposing situation, I'd like us to marinate our friendship a little bit because when it goes beyond acquaintance into friendship, right, doesn't that mean that you access like a different door in our hearts, right? Like an acquaintance, eh, maybe, maybe if it's convenient, right? But a friend, sometimes you bend over a little backwards, right? Sometimes you've got a sore back while I'm leaning and asking that happens sometimes, right? So in this moment, I would ask us to think about a friend. Not just in a neighbor or community member, but a friend knocks at midnight. Is there a situation that it would need to be for us to answer the door or to answer the phone? Or would it be enough that a friend called us in that late hour and obviously had a reason to get a hold of us? You know, I'm going to share with you just briefly for a moment to kind of bring this in perspective, at least for me, and it's a way for us to get to know each other is to share some things. Well, you know, there's something that happens in your, you know, um, when, you, when you graduate from high school, when you go to college and things like that, usually the great swash of, of your uh, connections are usually about the same age. Would you agree that usually if you go right out of high school to college, you're all dealing with young 20s and things like that? Well, you know, there's something that happens in our culture in young 20s. Not 20 or 22, but something happens at the age of 21 that you gain access to something of this world. <laughs> And it can create some situations that phone calls are made at midnight or later. Well, I was younger than most of my friends. I graduated uh, at 17, so I was only 20 when most of my friends were 21. So I started getting those phone calls. Because they knew, one, I couldn't participate, and they knew, two, that I did have a car with plenty of room for them. There was often times when I considered, what does friendship mean when I got those phone calls? And it's just a moment to share with you in those moments because was it inconvenient? Yep, I didn't plan on it. I got to work the next day. But you know, it's that moment where no matter what situation it was, especially in those times, a friend had a need. And they believed that if they contacted me, I would pick up the phone. They would be able to count on me. Now, we could go into another launching illustration in a moment, but I just wanted us to marinate on the depths of friendship and what we're willing to do. So Jesus says, suppose this friend comes to you at midnight and says, friend, let me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Well, this might be kind of a moment because, again, detach ourselves from our lives and look at the biblical culture here. Why would somebody be arriving at midnight? They didn't send a text. All right, they didn't respond to Facebook to tell us, hey, I'm going to be there in a couple of days. It was common in those times why hospitality was so big was because journeys were so long and so unexpected because when weather is hot, we know something about hot weather, folks, lately, right? That you would want to stay out of the sun so you would travel at night. You would actually put in most of your miles at night because it's cool, right? And the animals would be able to travel further. So a lot of times you get these people at odd times. Well, also, we provided just enough for our families. In that time, they didn't have freezers, and, and economically, it was hard for people to gather things that didn't waste. And so you would get up in the morning, or the wee hours where night was becoming morning, and you would make your bread for the day. Well, if we don't have much bread, the husbands are going to eat at the house. If someone else shows up, there might not be a whole lot left if we already finished dinner, right? Because we don't want to be a wasteful people, right? So most people would be caught without these things. So it's interesting that even the friend would know where to go. So in this moment, he's without. In order to honor the opportunity for hospitality, he goes on this journey and asks his neighbor, wake up, can you help me out? Can you give me something? 
And so this need seeker goes to his neighbor and wakes him up. Now we see this joyful response, don't we, from the neighbor that has woken up and glad to help. Let's see exactly what it says here. Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. Is that how we would respond? I mean, imagine if in that situation. It's in this moment where Jesus says that I can tell you outside of this, even though the friend that was woken up will not give you anything simply out of the strength of your friendship, right? It's saying that just because you are our friend, the answer is not going to be what you want. The need is not going to be fulfilled. But Jesus says that even though the friend won't do it out of friendship, he will do it out of shame, of your shameless audacity to ask. Some translations, like the NSRV, which is in your pew Bible, uh, actually say your persistence. And I'd like us to think about the difference here a little bit. And no translation is wrong. It just comes from a different perspective and seeks to meet us in different spots. But how does this sound if you say, but surely the neighbor that was woken up, though inconvenienced, would give you what you seek because you are persistent? There's a truth in that, right? Valuable. But this gets a little bit closer to the Greek original terminology and meaning. So I want to read that again from the, from the NIV here. It says, But he will get what he seeks because of the shameless audacity that he came to the neighbor and asked. And this is that moment where it's hard for us to talk shamelessly about something. And I would submit to you this to understand sometimes what shamelessly looks like. Right? There's a boldness in that. But if those of you who have ever had children or, or nieces and nephews or grandchildren um, or recently or just been around kids, we've all seen this same thing. Right? We've seen dad, 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 dad. And just pretend I do that for another three minutes until it gets really, really agitated. Right? So you can respond like me. What do you need, princess? <laughs> Or after three minutes of mom, 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 you can respond with what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. So we all get a little agitated, don't we, with, with when that happens? But isn't it that the, the, the child finds whatever is on their mind, they're shamelessly asking, right? I mean, they're persistent for sure, but they're shamelessly asking because whatever it is, whether we judge it as important or not, they're asking because they're expecting that whatever they have is important to you as it is to them. Right? So we've seen that shameless audacity in children asking their parents for something. So we see in this moment that Jesus says, how more so? And it takes so much time to explain where we're at, but understand that Jesus says, how much more so? Jesus is using this parable, this illustration, to set the stage for us, right? Because we're looking at how many times have we been obligated to help someone? Right? Because there might be a social pressure. Uh, there might be, well, if they tell somebody else, they sure don't want to be the schmuck that they do that for somebody, right? How many times, even if they're our friend and we love them dearly or our friends, that we still kind of do things more out of obligation than we do a full of joy? Would you agree that there are sometimes those situations? But we do them. We do them because we love them. But what Jesus is saying is it will get done because of the shameless audacity of asking. Sometimes the persistence of dad, dad, dad. But Jesus says, how much more than obligation or if other people ribbing you about why you should have done such things because out of cultural pressure, how much more so would God welcome the ask than the friend who was woken, who was inconvenienced? How much more so? See, Jesus says this story of imagine, so we can put ourselves in there and ask, how many of you would imagine a friend and say no to them? And we're all like, oh, of course you would, there's a need. Jesus says, no matter what propels, or, or no matter what pushes us to that decision, no matter what compels us, Jesus said, imagine then how much more that God who is not inconvenienced with your asking, with your seeking, with your knocking, takes joy in giving to us what is life-giving. The next part of the scripture reminds us that Jesus says, verse 9, So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And again, echoes those moments there. You know, yesterday, I think I shared briefly a bit about here, is that there was a firework display in the gun. It was kind of a big deal, right? 
And so I was invited to a new friend's house to be able to share in fellowship and, and some food and the fireworks and those kind of things. But I have to tell you, there's a funny thing when a small town has a homecoming gathered together, there's construction, there's roads blocked off. <laughs> so would you believe in our eagerness to go just across town? It's real easy to get to. All of a sudden, there's orange barriers everywhere, and there's people with badges that will give us tickets if we don't do what they say. And so this joyful moment turned into kind of stressful, right? In this moment where I was like, What's, how are we going to get there? What's going to happen? You've been on the expressway, you can see your exit, your, your traffic jam. I can just, I can see it. It's right there. I can see our new friend's house. It was right there. Like, I could get out and let my girls figure out how to get there, and I would be able to get together. <laughs> but I thought, ah, oh, we should drive as a family. But it was just that moment of, now I know how to get there out of the way, but how much more is it going to be easy in the days ahead because I'm familiar? I know what the house looks like from the front and the back. Hallelujah, we know how to get there in the back way, right? But think about in that moment that it was unfamiliar because I had never been there before. But now that I've been there before, it's becoming more familiar. And I can find it even when the roads are shut down, right? And so Jesus says here, he wants us to be familiar that if we seek, knock, and ask, we will find what we're looking for. We will find a ready and available God expecting, waiting on us. Not to work, but to hear from us. Just like when we arrived at our new friend's house, they were waiting to tell us, thank you for being here, where to park, where to go, all these things to do. Make something foreign more familiar. And that's what Jesus is saying to us here in this moment. That when we make prayer in coming desperately to the Lord, a common daily bread practice, it's not going to seem so awkward. For those of in our infancy in our prayer journey, or maybe we've been praying a long time and we have a structured prayer at night or before meals, but how many of you would find it intimidating, and I'm not going to really ask you for hands, but just how many of you would find it intimidating to pray ten minutes? Ten whole minutes. About a half hour. And it's in those moments that, kind of like our Fitbit walk tracker, or our, our step tracker, you don't have to do it all in one big jump. Just do it several times over the day, and you'd be surprised how much you added up in there, in these moments. But Jesus is saying, make it a familiar thing for us to trust God with everything. Sometimes we can sing insignificant, can't we? Like, is Lord, is God really listening to us? Because it's just one thing, and it's, I don't know, it's kind of and a little and this is important to me. If it's important to us, it's important to God. But God loves us. And God's not intimidating about the big things. In this moment, I'd like to remind us of the power of prayer. But I don't want to leave us simply alone with that because we could, we could have another hour. We're not going to. We could have another hour just delving into some of these moments. But there's something very important. And again, I would challenge you this week to take a look at this entire this entire chapter 11 and go over those things again. Because when I told you that our first word of chapter five, or verse 5 was then, we said the Lord's Prayer right before this. Chad led us into that moment for prayer. This is that section of Scripture, chapter 11, 1 through 4, is Jesus' response to when the disciples say, well, how do we do this, this prayer thing? And the Lord's Prayer is inspired by those responses from Jesus in verse 1 through 4. So I'd invite us to think about that and take a look at that when we're looking at our devotionals this day. To read entire chapter 11 understanding that all this is framed. The second story is to lean into what Jesus just said, pray like this. And then he gives a bit of a story and illustration so we can see how we live into that. Finally, Jesus uh, says on here, he talks about uh, giving kind of these ridiculous gifts out of context, right? Okay, if somebody asks for an egg, you're not going to give them a scorpion, those kind of things. But it's important here because it says, if you then, though you are evil, read sin, right? Though we are of sinful nature, though we miss the mark, though we mess up, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more? There that is again, how much more? Even though we do things, even though some things can be obvious, we respond, how much more so would God meet our needs? Come seeking, knocking, and coming to find. And I shared that illustration about going to our new friend's house because I'm confident that no matter what they drive that one day, if the hour is inconvenient, 
or the need might seem a bit ridiculous. If I go to that door, I'm confident that you're going to ask. I'm confident that if they're home, they'll open the door. And I'm confident that no matter if the word got out, if it was inconvenient, or if it was simply out of love for me, that needs would be met. How much more so would God hear what's here and give us one? I want to leave you with this before we close the message today.
could we come expecting the Lord to hear our prayer and be glorified.